trust that uh, the saints will pray for me as I deliver my heart tonight. If you have your Bibles, we're looking in Ephesians chapter 4 and the second part of verse 27, a very uh, simple passage of Scripture. And actually just one little line of Scripture, Ephesians 4 verse 27, give no place to the devil. Then we're turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Here again, the second part of the verse. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices. I want to talk to you tonight about exposing Satan's misconceptions of God. Exposing Satan's misconceptions of God. Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Heavenly Father, would you anoint your word tonight? Would you come and give your servant clarity and strength and grace as we endeavor to share and to speak with those that are before us? And would your Holy Spirit do his precious work among us? We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said together, Amen. Amen. Tonight as we share uh, about our enemy Satan and expose the misconceptions he gives people of God, I would like to challenge you to just shift your thinking a little bit. We don't like to talk about some of these things, but we need to. Satan has lied repeatedly to people, and it has left individuals in a situation where they feel hopeless and unable to come to God. And it is indeed a lie of Satan. Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He is the father of lies. He is the great deceiver. He is the wolf in sheep's clothing. And our goal tonight is to expose some of the greatest lies that Satan has told that we might be able to guide you clearly into the love of God. First of all, there is a great misconception about four main components of the God of heaven. There's a misconception about Him being judge. We know that He is. He is also King. He is also Father. He is also Bridegroom. But there are misconceptions that are connected with every one of these uh, uh, attributes or titles that we give to God. First of all, God is judge. It is very true. Everyone here that knows the Scriptures would say that is absolutely true. God is judge. However, we understand that Satan would like to come in and misconstrue all of the ideas about God being judge. For instance, we would have this idea in our minds in some cases where God is standing with a gavel at 2 o'clock and He's about to bring it down with a thud and make it almost impossible for people to find Jesus and make it through to heaven. It is one of Satan's misconceptions of who God is as judge. Is He judge? Absolutely. If someone is hurled into eternity, God is judge. At the end of time, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Why? Because God is judge. God will have the final say. However, the truth of the matter is this. His gavel is not perched at 2 p.m. ready to come down and send people to hell. He desires that everyone knows Him and knows Him personally. Today is the day of grace. Today is the day of salvation. He has said in His Word, It is not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We must understand that God is judge, but today is the day of grace. He extends His arms to you. He extends His welcome, His conviction, His drawing power to you that you might come to Him and know Him personally. I sat in a men's retreat in Mendon, Ohio when this information was shared about God being judge, king, father, and bridegroom. And I found myself with tears in my eyes because I had pictured God as 80% judge. Understand me today. We know that He's judge. It's the truth of His Word. But today is the day of grace. Can you say amen? amen? Then He is also King. It is very, very true that He is King. He must be supreme. We cannot have the mistaken idea that we can serve Christ on, on Sunday and do it our own way the rest of the week. That is not true. He is King. He must be supreme. But Satan wants to tell us that God wants to do, uh, do all the things that He can to, re to take away our joy, to take away our fulfillment, to take away the pleasures of life. This is not true. Certainly the pleasures of sin He wants to remove from our lives, but not the pleasures of life. 
God has given us tremendous blessings. Satan wants us to believe that like earthly kings, he wants us to do just, just as subjects and as slaves and do the things that would benefit him or that he would come down on us with an iron fist. That is not a picture of the king that we know. He is a king that is supreme. We must give him supremacy in our lives, but he is not ruling with an iron fist. The story is told of a playground that was under construction, so they removed the fence. And what did they find? They found the children huddled in the middle because there were no boundaries and there was, there was no longer safety. And so God must be supreme and king for your good and mine, but he is not trying to remove the blessings of life. That is a misconception of who God is as King. He is also Father. This one is a pretty tough one because we've all had fathers we've known of that have blown it. Some of us as fathers, we have our own regrets. We could have done things better. But think about God being the ultimate role model as Father. He is fond, yet He is firm. Fond of His children, yet firm. He has to say no because there are some things that are not good for us. But the Scriptures tell us that if a father is asked bread of one of his sons, would he give him a stone? We know the answer is no. That father wants to give bread. The same is true for God. Satan wants you to think that God would like to give you a scorpion when you ask for fish. The Scripture says it is not true. Just as an earthly father would want to give a fish, if a fish is asked, your heavenly father wants to give good gifts to those who ask. Reprogram your mind and do away with the misconception and let God be God, the Father who is fond and firm for your good and for mine. Then we come to the bridegroom. I don't know if you can remember that far back when your bride was coming down the aisle, ladies, when your groom was standing at the front of the church. But God is the bridegroom and we as the church, those who know Christ, are the bride of Christ. And the groom watches for that moment that the bride will come down the aisle. And as we think of this in terms of spiritual things, we know that God is watching for His bride, and that is the church, those who know Him. Satan would like to lead hearts to believe that God does not care about us. God is aloof. He just kind of dropped us off here to fend for ourselves. That is a misconception of the bridegroom. That is not so. For the groom makes plans for his bride and desires to spend all eternity with his bride. If you study the Old Testament model of the groom and the bride becoming betrothed together, it is a picture of a, a, a groom going to his bride and upon that agreement he promises that he will come back again. He will prepare a place and he will come back again to get his bride. And they have uncovered archaeological digs that will show the foundation of the Father's house and another foundation coming off of it. Why? Because he had a son that went and promised the, the bride to be that he was preparing a place. No cell phones, no email, no U.S. mail system. It probably wouldn't have gotten there anyway. But he went later on when everything was ready and he called his bride and they were married and she went with them for a life of, of honorable uh, married uh, couple together. So here the misconception of the bridegroom is that Satan wants you to believe that God doesn't care. He's not watching for you or looking for you, but it is not so. He is like a groom that is looking down the aisle to receive his, receive his bride, the church. The second misconception, apart from these four in a quartet, the second one is that the God of heaven uh, cannot allow you to live the Christian life. Now let me reword that. That didn't come out right. It's a misconception that you can't live the Christian life. Satan would like to lie to individuals and just tell them it's just too hard. You can't do it. You can't live the Christian life. That is not so. You can. The Scriptures say that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Someone might say, well, I went to the bank. I went through the drive through Absolutely. I hope you stopped and made the transaction. Any of us can fly through the drive through You've got to stop and make a transaction. Salvation is more than reciting a prayer. It is more than signing a card. 
Salvation is when we ask Jesus personally to come into our lives and make that difference and old things pass away and all things become new and He transforms your heart and makes you want to serve Him. Can you say amen? amen. He makes the Christian want to serve Him. Psalm 37 and verse 31 he said the law of his God is in his heart. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. There is a new covenant based on Jesus' blood. And it is glorious and it makes us right with God. Oh, I'm so thankful that I can tell you today that salvation brings a change. And it will transform your heart if you'll only let him. Now, I don't know about you, but I like breakfast. And there isn't anything quite like a southern breakfast. Oh, you get down south there, you have to have an interpreter read the menu. They got things like flapjacks and all kinds of things you haven't heard from in the north. But I just have a feeling that if we all packed up on a gospel bus and went down south for a breakfast, it wouldn't be long and the doors of the kitchen would swing open and that hot steaming food would come out. And the lady would give you just what you ordered. She'd put down the bacon and the eggs and the flapjacks and a bowl of white stuff. And you'd say, wait a minute, ma'am, wait, there's a problem with this order. I didn't order that white stuff. And she's going to stop and call you sweetheart. And she's going to say, sweetheart, those are grits, and they just come with it. And I want to tell you that if you think that you cannot live the Christian life, it's a misconception that Satan has given you. Because when the blood of Jesus is applied and He washes away your sins and He makes all things new and old things pass away, the grace of God to live the Christian life, it just comes with it. Say amen. Oh, I want to tell you that old things pass away. All things become new. You can't do it in your strength. I can't do it in mine. But we do it through the grace and the strength of God. That just comes with it. Oh, reprogram your mind if Satan has told you that you can't live the Christian life. You can by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the third misconception of God is that He enjoys heaping guilt and condemnation on people. Oh, I want to tell you there are individuals that have lived under the cloud of guilt. They've sought the Lord and they've still lived under a cloud of guilt and condemnation. It is a misconception of God. He said, it's not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And those who, who He sets free, He sets free indeed. Can you say amen? amen? I know tonight the first responders and the military personnel that we are addressing, and of course everyone else, everyone is included. Those who are first responders, you've seen horrific sights and perhaps your efforts failed. I want to tell you tonight, Satan would like to heap blame and guilt on you because you feel like you didn't do enough. But don't let Satan give you that misconception of God. He has no desire to, to heap that on you. Sin has its own built-in guilt. Sin brings its own built-in conviction through the Holy Spirit. God's not trying to dish out a double portion. That is a misconception of God. Military personnel in some instances have had to respond in ways that, that marked your memory and you just haven't gotten over it yet perhaps. The, the, the uh, testimony that we just heard was very stirring. We go through things that are very difficult, but God through the power of His Spirit is drawing our hearts to Himself and thank God for the work of His Holy Spirit. Don't allow Satan to heap that guilt and that uh, condemnation on you. I remember James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family, was interviewing a woman on the radio. She had had an abortion. She had found Christ and found forgiveness and liberty. And as he was interviewing this woman, he stopped in the midst of that interview and he reminded her of the words of that song, He breaks the power of canceled sin. Can you say amen? He breaks the power of canceled sin. Oh, correct that misconception of God in your mind right now. Jesus came to bear sin. He came to bear grief. He came to bear sorrows. That was the purpose of the cross. Oh, I want to urge you tonight at the end of the service, go to the cross. That's where sins are born. That's where griefs and sorrows are born. And it's already been done. It is the time. It is finished in history. And you have to come and accept that tremendous gift from Him. There was a war veteran who was strugg struggling with the trauma of the battlefield. And it just happened to be that a Jewish rabbi was trying to help the man. 
He was struggling so much with the trauma after returning from war. His left arm hung limp at his side. He had no use of his left arm. So the Jewish rabbi had planned to meet with him. He thought I could help him in some way. And so he told the man as he got to his office, please share your story with me. So the man began to share his story. He said, I was given a post of duty out on the hillside and we were given a machine gun with a tremendously long belt of ammunition. And he said, our, our instructions were that if enemy soldiers came over the ridge, we were to keep a curtain of lead between them and us to prevent their advancement. And then the rabbi stopped him. He said, wait a minute, just a second here. I want to get a clear picture of what you're talking about. Rearrange the furniture here in my study. I'll help you. I want to see what your little, your little uh, uh, barricade looked like, your little uh, uh, system or, or setup on the hillside. So soon they moved furniture around, got a broomstick for the machine gun, and he said, now continue, tell me the story. So the man wrapped his arm around the broomstick. He said it wasn't long at all. And uh, the soldiers began coming over the ridge from the enemy's side. I knew that I couldn't keep my finger from the trigger because they would have advancement immediately if I did. It wasn't long and my comrade Charlie had been hit. And he, I knew he was hit. I knew he was injured. I knew he was bleeding. Somehow Charlie made it over to my side. But he said I still had my finger on the trigger. I couldn't allow the enemy to advance. He said, then as that belt of ammunition kept clicking through that machine gun, finally, he said, Charlie said, water, I need water. But he said, I was so committed with my finger on the trigger, I could have passed it to him with my left arm, but I didn't, I didn't. He said, I killed Charlie. When I got done, Charlie was dead. And the rabbi realized immediately what was happening. The man was under a false guilt. The man had not killed Charlie. He had been doing what he was instructed to do in the military. And that was his first orders. Do not let the enemy advance. And then the rabbi began to encourage him and get him into counseling and help him with his trauma. And an amazing thing happened. His left arm that had never been hit with a bullet, never been hit with shrapnel. It was the arm that should have passed the water. It began to swell. It began to take on fluid again. It began to take on muscle again. And he regained the usage of his left arm. He was psychologically punishing himself because Charlie died. Today I want to tell you that you have those same, those same lies to discredit of the enemy. He wants to bring to you lies that say you can't make it in. You can't seek Christ. You can't find Him. You've gone too far. You've done too much. It is a lie of the enemy. Saints say amen. It is a lie of the enemy. And I want to tell you that whatever it is that is uh, paralyzed in your life, God can take care of it tonight. He wants to. If you've had a misconception that He is a judge that's coming down so hard you couldn't make it in, or a king that has so many rules that there's no way you could possibly comply, or a father that isn't fond but always firm, that is a misconception. Throw it all aside and see Him for who He is. The bridegroom with outstretched arms. And He says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus suffered on the cross to take away your sin, to take away your griefs, to take away your sorrows, to take away your guilt. It is the resurrection of Jesus that makes you a new creature. And old things will pass away and all things will become new. He gives you victory through Jesus Christ. He gives you the hope of heaven through Jesus Christ. Would all the saints say amen? Oh, in a few minutes when our other speaker is done, I want you to see the hands of Jesus outstretched as He says, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I challenge you, if you don't have that rest tonight, that you'll find a place of prayer. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week. Don't put it off. Discredit the lies of Satan. And Jesus waits for you with outstretched arms. May God add His blessing to His Word. Amen.